Hello again, this is Ruben Major. I am an instructor and program director as well as the chief executive officer for EMS University. And this particular section we're going to be discussing lifting and moving patients. Um, it's going to be a pretty brief chapter uh, because this is all very practical, hands-on stuff. So uh, we won't really go into a whole lot of detail with this particular information. I just kind of want to give you the general overview for purposes of the uh, quizzes at the end, the examination at the end if you're taking that. And uh, just want to kind of give you the I general idea. Okay, so first when we talk about moving people um, that are injured, you have to remember that whenever you move a person there is a chance that you might cause further injury to them and it's very important to wait for extra help if you need it uh, it's, it's always best to have extra hands in the event that uh, you need it because you don't want to end up hurting yourself or hurting the patient there is a possibility that you might have to move the victim to protect uh, them from danger at the scene this might occur, say, in a vehicle accident uh, where the car is on fire or you have an assailant that has reappeared at the scene and it's become unsafe again. These sorts of things might present a problem for you where you need to rapidly move the patient as soon as possible to, to bring them into safety. Uh, you also might need to move the victim to a flat surface to provide CPR. So, again, you know, we, we've experienced this over the years. You want to make sure that if there's a patient that's on the bed, that you put them down on the ground and do CPR on them or put them on a backboard prior to doing CPR. That way you can get better compressions and you're not making, you're, and all the force is not going into the bed. Body mechanics are very important when you're lifting patients. There's a, a great possibility that if you do not use proper lifting techniques, you can injure yourself. And since you're lifting and moving patients and equipment all day long and all night long, you are putting a great deal of stress on yourself and you eventually might end up having back issues if you do not lift properly every time that you lift. So, therefore, it is important to make sure that you're lifting with your knees and not your back. So specifically for these techniques you need to know what your physical ability and limitations are. Now if you have a patient that is very heavy and you think there's a chance you might need lift assistance give a call to another unit because again it's not worth you injuring yourself over. It is just not worth it always call for lift assistance when you do not feel that you can move the patient without injuring yourself, your partner, or the patient. You can plan these lifts. And over time, you might think, well, me and my partner, we have this, you know, standard language and or this standard process that we use whenever we lift a patient. We just kind of give each other a nod and lift them up. Even though you might do that, something might happen where you guys are not on the same page. And so that's why it's always very important to make sure you're communicating everything to you and all the other people that are around you. So whether you know, you're know you lifting a patient, putting them on a gurney, or you're lifting them and on, on from a backboard onto the gurney, you know whatever you're doing, make sure you plan the lift, have good communication, make sure you have a good grip on the patient, and test the load. So position your feet properly before starting the lift and lift with your legs, not, not with your back. Just like we said before, lift with your legs, not with your back. If you lift with your back, and you know, some of, for some of you people that are older or have had back, back problems before, you'll know that when you lift with your back, you can totally throw it out just like, like nothing. So make sure that you always use your legs and not your back. And the reason why I keep emphasizing that is because that is just the number one issue 
that providers will have over the years. So body mechanics and lifting techniques. Remember to keep the patient's weight as close to your body as possible. And then also, whenever you're lifting, make sure you're not turning to the right or turning to the left or trying to, you know, do those sorts of things. You know, you should always just do like a nice square lift and not twist. And this is difficult when you're carrying things like an airway bag or hard equipment, extrication tools and those sorts of things because, you know, those, those aren't necessarily things that you can always pick up and carry right in front of you. But always be conscious and, and make sure you can, or make sure you try to if you can. Keep it as close to you as you possibly can and try not to twist. Make sure, again, communication is very important that you communicate with everybody that's on scene. And when the patient is on a stretcher or backboard, you should always take care to carry them in a manner where they can be see or where they can see where they're going. This will help to minimize patient apprehension. So if you're in an elevator, for example, and you have the patient with you, make sure that you carry them so that they can see the elevator open and not the other way. It's very important for them to be able to have a line of sight as to where they're going. So don't wheel them in anywhere backwards. And same thing goes for when you're on scene and you're and you have a say mass casualty incident try not to carry them backwards because this will just further cause apprehension to them and when standing the proper position is upright with your head shoulders and hips vertically aligned so remember head shoulders and hips those have to be aligned in order for you to lift properly other important lifting techniques the power grip that's defined as placing your palm and all the fingers in contact with the object being lifted so like the gurney handle. And then when you're lifting a patient, remember to push yourself up with your stronger leg, not the weaker leg. And recovery position. So we'll kind of go, I guess we're kind of going into positions now. So going into positions, uh, the recovery position helps to keep your airway open and allows the fluid to drain from the mouth. It prevents aspiration and if possible, you want to put them on the left side. The reason why is because pregnant females will need to go on their left side to prevent them from having issues with their uh, pregnancy and their blood pressure. So if, again, if possible, put them on the left side. We'll go over that information more if, if you're uh, taking the OB section as well. So continue to monitor your breathing. Also, this is known as the Haynes position, and Haynes stands for high arm and endangered space. So, and the person that invented it, uh, just a gee whiz thing, is named John Haynes, if you want to look him up. And uh, those are the acronyms for the position. So, high arm in endangered space. The recovery position for an unresponsive breathing infant. So, here's kind of a different one, but. The recovery position is for this uh, infant is going to be face down over your arm with their head slightly lower than the body. And this is kind of like the choking position where you're going to be, not the choking position, but what you would be putting the, what position you would be putting the infant in if you were dealing with a choking in emergency. So support the head with your, uh, the head and neck with your hand and keep the nose and mouth clear. Okay. So this particular skill is called the recovery position. And as we just went over this, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to put the patient's arm out above their head. And then the other arm, you're going to want to put over the uh, top of their chest. Next thing is, you're going to want to lift this particular leg so that when you turn them over, they don't end up uh, falling flat on their face. And you'll see this in just a second how this works. So, And then put the forearm near the, uh, the victim's head under the victim's shoulder and then um, with the hand under the hollow of the neck. So just basically underneath where that little gap is under the neck. And then when you turn them, you see because of the fact that you had the knee kind of bended a little bit, again, they're not, they're not going to fall directly into the prone position. And then their um, arm is going to be making sure that their head maintains airway. 
And then this uh, this last particular area is continue, it says continue to support the head and neck, position the victim's hand palm down. So if you take a look at this hand right here, this is actually a very critical step. And the reason why is because it really protects the airway so much better to when you just take this hand and you tuck it underneath the shoulder. So just make sure that you do that when you're doing this recovery position. Uh, position. Don't just lay them down on the left-hand side and call it a day. Lay them on the left side, how it shows in the slide, but then also stick your hand underneath the uh, patient's shoulder right here. Just It's a really good way to provide stabilization. And then check the airway and open the mouth to allow drainage. So, and the reason why we discuss this particular um, this particular topic and kind of emphasize it more than the others is because it's one of probably the, the most misunderstood positions out there. This is the recovery position that you would put somebody in. It's not just laying them on their left side. Um, a, a lateral recumbent position is a position like this. So, and this works obviously best for the unconscious patient. A conscious patient may be a little bit different. You just say, you know, you need to lay on your left side. And you're not going to force their arm underneath or anything like that. This is a very, very good position, though, uh, for somebody who's unconscious because you don't have to sit there and try to hold them upright. Emergency moves. So we talked a little bit about those before. Just make sure that in an emergency uh, move that you use them only if the patient faces immediate danger. And you cannot give life-saving care because of the location and or position. Actually, it would be or, not and. So either one of these two things will work. And remember, like I said, car fire, house fire, those sorts of things. Um, it, you know, if you catch yourself in a, a situation like that, you're going to want to move them out. Obviously, you're going to want to have been trained in rescue, uh, but so you know, those are the kinds of immediate moves we're discussing. So remember, uh, extreme hazards, those sorts of things. Emergency moves. So moving the patient quickly uh, risks aggravating a spinal injury. So try not to move them, um, you know, with try not to move them too roughly. Make sure that you are moving them along the long axis to keep their head and neck in line with the spine. It is impossible pr to protect the spine when removing the patient from a vehicle quickly. So you know, you, you're going to try your best, but obviously it's not going to be a catch-all. So be very, very careful and cognizant of the way that you move them as you are potentially uh, risking their uh, s their spinal cord and, and uh, potentially you may be causing or aggravating paralysis issues. Uh, when you move victims with help, uh, the responsive victim, you have a two-person walking assist right here, which you might be able to use in a two-handed seat carry. So these are two different ways. And, you know, the reasons why we would do something like this, maybe for like a lower extremity injury with no suspected spinal trauma, um, maybe an ankle injury or those sorts of things. And you have a two rescuer extremity carry. And uh, basically, this is a way to carry them down, uh, say, a flight of stairs. And notice this is not, you know, there's not one person walking backwards and another one walking forward. You know, one person is in between uh, their legs at the knees and taking them down the stairs so that they could see where they're going. Um, you know, again, it might might be best to consider using a stair chair if you have one. Uh, just just a thought for this particular um, for this particular one. Also, you also you also have to think. You know, what if you have a bigger patient? You know, then then it, you might need to call in additional resources to help you with this move. If you're pushing objects, always try to push instead of pull if you can. When you pull, you put strain on your back. So this is a reason not to pull. When you push an object, you should be sure to push from between your waist and your shoulder. 
Uh, we have EMS equipment for moving patients. So first responders often assist EMTs with packaging and moving patients. You know, a wide range of commercial devices are available. Uh, you know, you again, you know, it, it always varies. So, you know, you might be using this particular, uh, the, the KEDS board. You may be using a short board to accomplish the same task. Uh, there's different kinds of brands. So just make sure you know exactly what it is that you're um, using and know how to use it before you use it. Uh, typical equipment for packaging and moving patients. So you have a long backboard, you have short backboards. Um, again, long backboards for you know your typical s spinal trauma and short backboards would be either for pediatric use or it might be for uh, somebody that you're extricating and you have have uh, and you're doing it in, in a manner where it isn't necessarily a rapid move um, you know like so a vest extrication device would be a good example of you know you you might do that also the standard stretcher uh, where you would put the patient on the stretcher or a portable stretcher. There's also orthopedic stretchers and basket stretchers and the stair chair like we talked about before. Now the scoop stretcher is an interesting piece of equipment. Uh, the scoop stretcher is designed for use in confined areas. The scoop stretcher is um, also being used in some places for regular standard movement of patients who might possibly have spinal compromise and there's a little bit of uh, th this is a very relatively new process but the scoop stretcher is a very very helpful uh, piece of equipment uh, now that we've gone through all of this information um, you know just to kind of reiterate to you guys you know it's a very apologize for that um, it's really important for you to remember that you have to take in consideration again your back whenever you're moving the patient it is not worth it for you to end up having a back injury because you moved somebody incorrectly always remember and never forget to use proper lifting techniques whenever you're carrying patients and what that means again is lifting with your knees and not your back very very super important um, I think that will do it for us for this particular section.